Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. Breath of the Wild has a variety of interesting and unique characters which help flesh out the game's world. The tragedy of Dorian, whose wife was killed in response to his betrayal of the Iga clan, and Buliara, a Gerudo who comes off as strict and cold, yet has a meaningful relationship with the chief Riju. But when it comes to those which stick out, usually it's the stranger ones, whether it be their dialogue, actions, or the overall encounter. In today's video, I'll be looking at 10 of these characters in no particular order. I want to focus on some of the less important characters, meaning there won't be any horn statue, kilton, or horse god, but know that they are honorable mentions. Lots of Breath of the Wild quests follow the same generic formula. Some NPC wants the player to collect a certain number of a certain item in exchange for a reward which is either worth the efforts or a complete ripoff. One of these quests is found at the Gerudo Canyon Stable, where Piro requests 55 rush rooms for a single diamond. After the quest is complete, you can continue to give him this item in bundles of 55, and Piro will purchase them for double the market value. But when you take a step back and look at the context of the situation, it's quite hilarious. Piro states that he first tried rush rooms at the age of 5, and has continued to eat them every day since without fail. These days, he requires Rush Rooms to function, and goes as far as to exchange a diamond for this food. It's clear that Piro has an addiction, and all Link is doing is making this addiction worse. Better yet, the food he's addicted to is a type of mushroom, and the whole exchange gives off the vibes of a drug deal. He even goes on to ask Link if he's brought the stuff. Yeah, totally not sketchy, dude. The only reason you'd want to finish this quest is for the sake of completion, since while you can continue to trade 55 to him, the profit you get is 170 rupees less compared to the initial trade since the value of a diamond is 500. One thing that is interesting is the number of rush rooms he requires. There is significance to this number as he does state it has been 55 years since he first tried them, so that's kind of interesting. Breath of the Wild has a variety of dishes the player can cook which either heal Link or give him buffs. A lot of the recipes for these meals are found by interacting with the world, such as through character dialogue, the many stables, or books. That is, unless you're like me, who usually makes a ton of hearty dishes, making the other health replenishing ones kind of useless. Some side quests, like a royal recipe and cooking with cocoa, will reward the player with knowledge of how to make certain dishes. But some people just aren't cut out to be cooks. I am of course talking about Moza, a Hylian found close to the Ishto So Shrine. It's not too difficult to find her, just look for the pile of smoke rising into the air, something that Link mistakes for a smoke signal. But in reality, it's one of Moza's experiments which has unfortunately been overcooked, now burnt to a crisp. Like other NPCs, she'll teach Link a variety of unique recipes, a lavish meat dish, an ancient meat dish, and ultimate survival dish. The ingredients for these recipes start out normal, such as some steak or bird meat, however it goes off the rails rather quickly once she adds in a piece of ore or guardian part. The most normal dish she has has to be the ultimate survival dish, and even that's just composed of several monster parts. Moses convinced that any ingredient she uses will turn out perfect, which, judging by the piles of garbage around the area, is probably the reason she's failed at making anything, well, edible. The best part about this encounter is how the crates several feet away from her contain ingredients which are actually edible, and would be the perfect substitutes for the ore and ancient parts. But you do have to admire her dedication. She wakes up at 5 in the morning and stays in front of the cooking pot until midnight and when asleep, she's thinking about her recipes for the following day. Moza's putting in the effort, it's just that she is approaching it from the worst possible angle. You can't help but feel bad for her as she knows her recipes turn out badly, though she remains optimistic throughout her endeavors and believes that tomorrow will be the day she turns it all around. Well, at least she has passion. Vilia is one of the more mysterious characters in terms of backstory and the only one on this list that the player will encounter if they're following the main story. Upon arrival, Link is unable to enter Gerudo Town as men are forbidden. 
The player can find a man named Benja, just outside the town, who mentions a man that has successfully infiltrated the place numerous times. Link finds this individual atop the general store at Karakara Bazaar. When told of the man who snuck into Gerudo Town, Vilia states that she knows nothing about him. Link can purchase a set of Vi clothing from this person, but just before he leaves, a gust of wind blows the veil, revealing Vilia's face. The camera angle doesn't give us a clear view, however the concept art in Masterworks and some footage from Boundary Break reveals their facial features. It's very likely that this person is a Hylian and not Gerudo. However, we still don't know their gender. But when Link accuses Vilia of being a man, her response comes off as rather negative. This could mean one of two things. Either Vilia is a male pretending to be a woman to access Gerudo Town and is denying the accusations so that her disguise isn't compromised, or she's a transgender woman. The only time this NPC is referred to with masculine pronouns are the rumors from Benja and adventure log entry for the Forbidden City entry quest. Every other character refers to them as a female, but since this could be a way to bypass the no men allowed rule of the town, we don't really know. Though, one can't help but appreciate Vilia as a character because it leads to one of the best moments in the game since Link looks adorable in women's clothing. Something that, no doubt, the artists have taken advantage of. It's not necessarily him or her that's strange, but more so the events leading up to this entertaining encounter. This leads to the fourth character on a list. list. Was be oh, no, not again. Why does this always happen to me? <sighs> if only there were a way to protect myself from viruses and hackers. Hey, you! Oh no, it's happening again. Yes, I'm talking to you. I already told you that I am not doing a Mifa episode. What? No, I was going to tell you the answer to your problem. Thanks to the kind folks over at NordVPN, you can browse the internet while remaining anonymous and protect yourself from all sorts of cyber attacks. Well, that sounds useful. Where can I get this NordVPN? Easy! Just go to the link in the description, nordvpn.com slash nintendobc, where you can use code nintendobc and get a huge discount on a two-year plan with one additional month for free. NordVPN not only protects your privacy, but lets you connect to multiple servers and access content unavailable to your own country. And let me tell you, for a person who makes their whole living off the internet, keeping your information secure is a must. There is also a 30-day money-back guarantee, just in case you aren't satisfied with what you get. Never again will you have to worry about your privacy when browsing those hundreds of pictures of Zelda fan art. Look, it, it wasn't hundreds of them. It's not like I'm obsessed with her or anything. That's nordvpn.com slash n-i-n-t-e-n-d-o-b-c. Thanks a lot, sir. I just have one more question for you. How did you get inside my house? Oh, uh, well, you know, while our product protects you from cyber attacks, it doesn't protect you from house robberies. Ah, that makes sense. Wait, what do you mean by house robberies? Hey! Where are you going, my TV? Get back here! And now, back to today's scheduled program. At the time of my first Breath of the Wild playthrough, I had only played a select few Zelda games. You'd imagine my surprise once I found out that Beetle was not a Breath of the Wild exclusive character. As a matter of fact, he makes an appearance in Skyward Sword, Wind Waker, Phantom Hourglass, and Spirit Tracks. So why exactly is he on this list? Well, unfortunately, Beetle suffers from a rare but deadly disease. One that I call Nurse Joy Syndrome, because he appears everywhere. No matter what part of the map it is, if it has a stable, you know that Beetle will find his way there. And unlike the other games in the series, he travels on foot instead of a boat or airship. No matter what stable you go to, he always finds a way to get there before you. It makes you wonder if they're really the same character. As the name implies, Beetle loves beetles. Whenever the player talks to him with one of these insects in their inventory, Beetle asks that Link give it to him in exchange for an elixir. If this offer is turned down, he'll remain silent for a moment and proceed to guilt trip the player, stating how he's not a very good judge of character. But his absolute favorite is the energetic rhino beetle. Refusing this trade leads to a moment where Beetle considers theft. He plans to sneak it out of Link's inventory and replace it with a common beetle. He won't know the difference. 
No, he'll hire someone else to do it. There's no point to get his hands dirty. Jeez, it's just a beetle beetle. No need to go that far to get it. But I wonder why I was attacked by a foot soldier minutes after this encounter. Unless... No, there, there's no way he would go that far for an energetic rhino beetle. But now that I think about it, in Skyward Sword, he drops the player through a trap door if they don't purchase anything from the shop. He clearly enjoys inflicting pain onto others. Perhaps there's more to him than meets the eye. There's one side quest in Breath of the Wild where Link is able to purchase a house within Hateno Village. After speaking to Bolson, the owner of the construction company scheduled to demolish the house, he agrees to sell it to Link for 3,000 rupees and 30 bundles of wood. Following these events, Bolson will upgrade parts of the house, such as adding a door or bed, at the cost of more rupees. Bolson himself is quite the character, wearing flashy clothing and creating his own dance, one that is apparently popular with the young people. And while his actions resemble that of an effeminate Hylian male, that isn't why he's included. There's nothing wrong with the way he acts. Bolson is mostly found sitting at the campfire situated close to the abandoned building. After purchasing the house, he remains there and will upgrade it so long as Link has enough rupees. But once you've bought everything, he doesn't leave this spot. Bolson continues to sit here, and no matter how much time passes, he'll never move. And at the time of the game's release, many players went on the internet to voice their opinions of him as a character. Some okay with the idea of Bolson hanging around the property, while others were desperate to get rid of him. There is one way to keep him away, as he'll travel to Terrytown for the wedding. As long as the player doesn't talk to him after this event, he'll stay away from Link's house. Unfortunately, this means it's possible to have him permanently sitting outside the player's house if they've already completed the quest and talked to Bolson. In a way, this makes Bolson a squatter, one who occupies an area of land but doesn't own it. Though on the wiki, the exact definition of a squatter is someone who is occupying an abandoned or unoccupied area of land, which technically differs from Breath of the Wild since that land is owned by Link. And this led to a sort of controversy surrounding this character. As a matter of fact, there's a video which covers this topic, trying to answer the question of, are Bolson's actions legal? Now, I won't go into too much detail regarding this topic, since Mechasakis did a pretty good job summarizing it. Though there are two points worth mentioning. One that's mentioned in the video itself is how Link technically didn't sign any contracts, meaning that the house isn't legally his. Any complaints of his would be ignored since there's no documentation of the purchase. However, while we don't see Link sign anything in game, Bolson does mention a permit in his initial charge of 50,000 rupees. I'm no expert when it comes to this sort of stuff, however from what I've found, building permits cover home construction, demolition, and renovations. I'm not sure if it's also used for proof of ownership, feel free to let me know in the comments. If that's the case, perhaps Bolson sold Link the house while holding on to this permit. Another possibility is that Bolson sold Link the house, but not the land it's on. In this case, he'd be doing nothing that is illegal. Either way, the fact that he hangs around the player's house and isn't seen anywhere else is definitely strange and makes him a worthy addition to this list. Kato's another character that's technically encountered during the main quest, but has little relevance to the story. The player is confronted by him and Dorian before first entering Impa's house. As one of her bodyguards, he takes his role seriously and protects the village from any danger, including the Yiga clan. If he's not on watch duty, chances are you'll see him watching his flock of Kukos. He even provides a similar quest to Andrews from Ocarina of Time, where Link needs to find and return the lost Kukos. However, Kato doesn't just like Kukos. He loves Kukos. So much so that the walls of his house are filled with drawings of the species. And the way he talks about Kukos, describing them as his little ones, or how time quickly passes when watching them, shows just how attached Kato is to chickens. Oh my gosh, is that a Zonai swirl? At first, you kind of feel bad for him, given the situation with his wife. She wants nothing to do with him, so the Kukos are his only emotional support. 
But when you look a bit further into it, you start to realize that perhaps the reason for his wife leaving him lies in how much affection he has for the flock. There's a journal within Kakariko Village titled Journal of Various Worries. It's a way for residents of the village to write down their problems while remaining anonymous. The first entry was written by an individual under the alias of the Bowmaster and states the following. Well, my wife left me today. The last thing she said to me was, what's more important, the Kukos or me? I chose the Kukos. It takes no expert to realize that Kato was the one who wrote this, meaning that his love for Kukos overshadowed the love for his own wife. And the only thing worse than the wrath of a Kuko attack is the wrath of a heartbroken female. <laughs> it's actually possible to locate Kato's wife in game. She's the owner of Kakariko's general store, the Curious Quiver. Rola states that there hasn't been a customer in a long time. Kato went by the alias of Bowmaster, meaning that he was the one who most likely kept her business afloat before their fallout. Rola even states how she's head over heels for one who can use a bow, and will occasionally mention her ex-husband, who we know as Kato. Even she describes his love for the chickens as an obsession, which, judging from the interior of his house, is a pretty fair assessment. At the very least, Kato must feel some sort of guilt as he wrote it in the Journal of Various Worries. I want to feel bad for him, but given what we know, it's most likely his fault that it's come to this. You know the saying, there's no stupid question? Well, that might be true, but there are stupid answers. Now, before you ask why I started with that bit, we must first travel west to the Gerudo Wasteland. Within the desert lies a bustling town filled with things to do. Shops lining the street, a bar, even a secret club which sells unique armor. One activity Link can be a part of is by the Barracks, a class taught by Ashe, titled Vo and Yu. The purpose of this lesson is to give advice to Gerudo women who wish to interact with men outside of the town. Ashe presents the women certain what-if scenarios to hear the different answers and critique them as a means of preparing them for the outside world. How to approach someone you've never interacted with, or what to do if you come across an injured Vaux. Not only do their answers differ from one another, but it gives the player a brief look at each of their personalities. The first two students, Pasha and Dina, respond to these questions with practical solutions. However, the third Gerudo of the class, Riza, manages to stand out as her answers to each of the hypothetical situations are... questionable. Stating how she would strike a fierce blow to an unsuspecting Vo when approached, which Ashe labels as a crime, or threatening to break a man's arm unless he agrees to marry her. One of Riza's more quote-unquote normal responses comes from a question of what she would do if a Vo were lying on the ground injured. Riza states how she'd secretly bring him back to her house where she could help him gradually recover. While the overall intention seems good, Ashe compares it to kidnapping, and she's technically not wrong. Now, the biggest problem isn't how bad these answers are, it's what she says when talking to Link. Riza states that she's only taking these classes as a kind of refresher course, which implies that she genuinely feels that her solutions to these hypothetical scenarios are the correct ones. She clearly has a lack of social skills when it comes to interacting with men, as her answers either involve violence or kidnapping. The only reason she's taking this class to begin with is because her grandmother urged her to, meaning that there must be some concerns for when she inevitably leaves Gerudo Town. Definitely one of the more interesting characters which can be easily missed by players. And now we're going to be looking at the top three. While the previous ones listed are in no numerical order, the few mentioned here are what I believe to be Breath of the Wild's three strangest characters. And unlike the other seven, these are listed from least to the most strange. Most people believe that there are four Blight bosses in Breath of the Wild. Thunder Blight, Fire Blight, Water Blight, and Wind Blight Ganon. This statement is factually false. There exists one other in the game, a being so powerful that even Thunder Blight Ganon dare not to mess with its affairs. The Scourge of Gila Rao Shrine. Flower Blight Ganon. Let's face it, you all knew this character was going to be on here. 
and for very good reason. By the time the player reaches the shrine, Megda has planted an assortment of flowers around the structure. When talked to, she allows Link to take a closer look, with one condition. Don't step on them. This is all part of the shrine quest, Watch Out for the Flowers. On the off chance that Link steps on them, Megda calls out, reminding him not to hurt the flowers, who, according to her, are screaming out in pain. The second time this happens, she'll get a bit more irritated at Link, reiterating how the plants are living things. So, what happens if you choose to do this a third time? Well, instead of me explaining it, it's probably best to just witness it yourself. Megda goes from being mildly disappointed with Link's actions to full-on psycho. And yes, the player does lose health when attacked by this NPC. While it's not possible to get a game over screen, as his health goes no lower than half a heart, the damage dealt by Megda is a consistent three hearts, no matter what armor Link may be wearing. Here's the thing, though. Megda is only number three on this list meaning that she isn't the strangest when it comes to Breath of the Wild characters. Now, who in the game could top a lady that attacks Link due to his carelessness around plants? Let's take a look. On surface level, Hino is a completely normal guy who happens to have an interest in the Blood Moon. The game is filled with its share of researchers, whether it be the scientists investigating the Leviathan Bones or Zelda's interest in Sheikah technology. Hino appears to know the basics of a Blood Moon, how it revives all defeated monsters at the stroke of midnight, though is unsure of why this phenomenon occurs. The Blood Moon is a rare event in which the moon turns a blood red color and rises into the sky. An eerie theme song plays, following a thin layer of malice which hovers slightly above the ground. The atmosphere will turn a deep red color, leading to the revival of previously slain monsters. After this, the moon returns to its original color and remains that way for the rest of the night. But what exactly happens when you witness this event at the Dueling Peak Stable, the same place you can find Hino? The moment the music plays and Malice covers the surface, Hino will immediately break into a dash and run around the stable like a madman. When talked to, he'll say a variety of things. It's so red. So gloriously red. My blood. It's boiling. Arise, monsters! As well as some audible grunts and groans. What's even creepier is his text, which takes on a red color as opposed to the usual white. It's almost as if Hino is possessed or under the influence of Calamity Ganon's malice. Statements such as his blood boiling, which is commonly associated with the hatred and malice of Demise and Ganondorf a topic recently discussed by Mass Nintendo Bandit. And Hino is the only NPC in the entire game who acts like this during the event. Definitely one of the creepier characters in this game, and why he sticks out compared to the others on this list. But alas, there can only be one winner of this competition. The character who, in my opinion, is Breath of the Wild's strangest. You know her, you love her, too bad though, because she doesn't love you. Loon is a female who's madly in love with Guardians. You can find her within Faron, on the shoreline of Puffer Beach, where she's getting a bit too comfortable with the Sheikah Orb, nicknamed Roscoe. The way Loon talks to this orb is rather disturbing as she treats it like a boyfriend, mentioning how its skin is smooth and gorgeous, acting as if the orb is a living, breathing thing, how it should come out of its shell and proudly show off its beauty. She believes Roscoe to be her lover, with a shy personality. 
Loon states that she'll never let the orb go, how she's head over heels for him. Technically, this is a lie. What Loon really wants to see are guardians, more specifically the Stalker, Skywatcher, and Scout. She's aware of the danger, but still insists on seeing them, which somehow makes her seem even crazier. Link can take a picture of these machines with his Sheikah Slate and present them to Loon, who quickly abandons Roscoe as she's all about guardians now. She goes from caressing the orb to calling it a weird sphere. It's as if she's in love with the guardians and wants one all to herself, despite knowing how dangerous they are. It's no coincidence that her name is Loon, as it's very close to the word loony. Someone deranged and possibly dangerous. Other synonyms for this word include crazy, nutcase, weirdo, insane. Yeah, these all perfectly describe this NPC. Sure, a character who attacks someone because of some plants or goes nuts at the sight of a blood moon is strange, but one who has romantic relations to an inanimate object, especially one that can kill you, is a whole other level of unsettling. The best part about this is, on the off chance you do take a guardian to her, she has the same reaction as all other NPCs and runs away from it. Clearly the developers never expected players to actually take one to Loon and added the default reaction to all characters, though it's still funny to watch. And this is why Loon is the strangest character in the entirety of Breath of the Wild. And that's all for today. Thanks for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed. If you want to see more content like this, then please consider subscribing as that does help out the channel. Special thanks to all of my Patreons, as your donations are greatly appreciated. A link to my Patreon page is down below, as well as Twitter and our Discord server. I've been Nintendo Black Crisis, and I'll see you all next time.